Hey, good morning, church family. Woohoo! You having a good time so far this morning? So good to be with you today. If you and I haven't met yet, I'm Jared. I'm grateful to be one of the pastors here. And if this is your first time with us or you're with us all the time, Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Sunday or whenever you're watching this with us this morning. Now, as many of you know, we're in week number six of this series entitled, Let's Go. Someone say, let's go. And hey, if you missed any of these messages from this series, please feel free to binge watch all five of them at our YouTube page at your convenience. And so don't miss out on that, it's good stuff. But listen, what we've been doing through this Let's Go series is we're looking at ways we can do this thing the Bible calls the Great Commission. The Great Commission. And, and how do we do this in our modern world today? Maybe you're new to this whole church thing and, and you're unfamiliar with this term, the Great Commission. Well, let me just break this down for us. The simplest way to kind of break out the Great Commission is to partner with Jesus to reach the world. It just simply means partnering with Jesus to reach the world. And, and what that means is, is that when we start following Jesus, when we abide in Him, He invites us, He calls us to partner with Him and, and, and to not just exist and take up space, but to make a difference and to change our world. Can you say amen to that, somebody? Man, He invites us to do this. And so today, as we continue on this Let's Go series, I want to speak to us specifically out of the subject that many of us may feel unprepared or inadequate to do when it comes to our faith. Today, I want to talk to us about the importance of sharing our faith, sharing the gospel, sharing our story to those around us. This morning, the message is entitled, You're on Mute. Have you ever heard that phrase before? I mean, man, I think for many of us, we know this phrase very well. In fact, over the past two years or so, we've had to adopt some phrases into our vocabulary, haven't we? Phrases that we used again and again, and we're, I'm sure for many of us, phrases that we're hoping we will never have to use again, right? Like phrases like, like social distancing, <laughs> or phrases like flatten the curve, or, or remember, I remember having long conversations about the phrase essential workers. Like who determines what's essential, right? But maybe more than any other phrase that we've had to learn out of the many phrases is the phrase that we say when we're on a Zoom call, say we're on a Zoom call and someone gets called upon a share and all of a sudden like there, you see their lips starting to move but nothing is coming out of the audio, right? Like, and, and, and that's when all of us, right? That's when everybody on the screen uses this phrase. In fact, can we say this phrase all together? Ready, go. You're on mute. You're on mute. Now listen, I have to confess that even after two years of probably having hundreds of Zoom meetings online, I still, unbeknownst to me, find myself unsuccessfully unmuting myself when I'm called upon to share. I mean, I, I, come on somebody, in that moment, right, I, you, you get all flustered, you're disoriented, having to find that mouse and that button, and, you, and it's frustrating, even today, right? Now, after saying that, I feel like some of us that are watching today, some of you are judging me right now. You're, you're thinking maybe like, you're thinking, come on, Jared, come on, PJ, what's the matter with you? I mean, it's been two years already, get with the program, let's go, unmute already. And I get it, man, I do. But can I ask us a question this morning? How many of us have ever felt that way when it comes to sharing our faith in Jesus? Like how many of us have ever had an opportunity to share God's goodness in our lives with someone in need, but instead in that moment felt muted? Like, like, like when, how many of us, man, we'd like to respond, but we're not sure how they would respond if we were to share our faith, or, or maybe you felt ill-equipped, or, or you thought maybe someone else can do that for you. Maybe a pastor or somebody professional. And so you chose to stay muted in that situation or circumstance. How many of us have ever been there before? Listen, I have. I have. In fact, I remember seven years ago when Angeline and I first felt called to pastor a church 
in Kahala. We were called, at, we were youth pastors. I was a youth pastor here at this church, and then God called us to minister at a church in Kahala. And I remember wrestling emotionally with all kinds of excuses and inadequacies as to why I wasn't prepared or I wasn't the right fit. And so I stayed muted in this new environment. Like I just felt like I couldn't have the platform to share even though I was hired there. And um, you know what? Whenever God brought these opportunities for me to share my faith and be bold in His goodness, I think I, I would reach for this thing. Maybe you know it. It's called this bag of excuses. You know what I'm talking about? No, this is just an illustration. It doesn't actually look like this, okay? This is a pretty nice bag, by the way. And, 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 uh, and I would reach for this bag of excuses, right? And it was full of this unhealthy self-talk that I've been conditioned to listen to for most of my life. How many of you have some of that? And, 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 and this, this self-talk was stuff that I was believing. Like I remember believing once before that I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, right? Or, or I wasn't the brightest color in the crayon box. And so I would, I would strive in, in, and I would have to strive to earn others' approval or acceptance or love. And I'd try to do that any way I could. And so I would kind of wear this bag, you know, I would wear this bag of excuses around and I would just kind of, yeah, just like walk around with it. And whenever God gave me an opportunity, I'd be like, wait, God, no, no, listen, like I have this excuse here. It's, it's in my bag. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and I got to tell you something, family. I got to tell you that, that God, he loves us so much that he meets us where we're at. He, he, he loves us where we're at, but he never leaves us where we're at. That's the good news about our God. And, and so when, when he gave me opportunities to, be, to share, I remember coming into this new environment, having to oversee, man, like 600 people every weekend. They, they would come to the church and have to oversee them. And it was overwhelming to say the least. And so I remember early on being asked to speak at a family camp. And I remember trying to find all kinds of excuses, right? The bag of excuses, all kinds of excuses of why I couldn't speak in front of these people. And so I would pull out, I would pull out these, these excuses that would justify me from bringing, like being on mute. One of those things was this lie that I said to myself, and it was this lie that said, you're not smart enough. You're not smart enough to share in front of these people, Jared. They're entrepreneurs, business professionals, doctors, lawyers, coaches, CEOs, and you're just some guy from Mililani that went to a local Bible college and you have this piece of paper that said you passed. Listen, you're not smart enough to share. And I remember just thinking like, oh man, you're right. You know, like just, and, and, and I, I believe just, just in this space, that was one of the barriers that I felt like the enemy used early in my life to mute me from sharing my faith boldly with the people that he called me to be around. Another excuse, I don't know if you can relate to me, another excuse that kept me muted while I was, um, was the fact that I had this growing family. Many of you know when we left Hope Chapel Mililani, we had two children and then three and then four when we were at this new place. And I remember thinking to myself, and I got this, I had the textbook earlier, I have this mirror here. And I remember thinking to myself, this unhealthy thinking as I pulled it out of this bag of excuses is, is, man, I am too busy. I am too busy to, to take on other people's drama. You know, like I, I, I'm like too, I have all this stuff. And if, and if I share my faith with them, with these people, they, they would take advantage of me. I'm, I'm sure of it. Or they would use my kindness for their gain. And listen, I'm too busy with my stuff and my own issue. Now, I know that sounds crazy a little bit as I say it out loud, but I, tell, I, I would tell myself that. I would, I would, it would, this would be a playlist in my mind. Now, another barrier that would keep me muted was my, um, my, my age. Like, I, I remember pulling out this excuse in my mind, like, like, oh man, Jared, you're too young and you're too inexperienced. You're too young and you're too inexperienced to minister to these people. And so I remember thinking like, man, these people drink coffee and I just, I'm just using the sippy cup, you know? <laughs> and, and, and these people are parents and grandparents and seasoned married couples and some have been through addictions and traumas and life experience that I haven't even heard of, let alone experienced. 
And Jared, you're just a kid. And you used to minister to only high schoolers. You're too young and too inexperienced for these people to share in front of these people. Now, I share all of that because I, I feel like if we're being honest, maybe for some of us, you have your very own bag of excuses as to why you, as to why you keep yourself on mute when it comes to boldly sharing your faith to those that God has put, strategically put around you. And so maybe for some of us, we reach into our bag and we pull out idea, this idea that you, you don't have what it takes. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't have what it takes to share this, kind of like me. Where I, and, and so I, you stay muted because of that. Or maybe for some of us, you pull out this idea like, man, I don't want to force my faith on others. And so I don't want to share because I don't want to force my faith on others. And so because of that, you stay muted. Or maybe for some of us, you have this idea that it feels awkward. Like I, I, it's uncomfortable for me to share, especially in our day to day. It feels awkward. And so because of that, you stay muted. And today I just feel like the Lord is calling us as a church and he's calling us um, as individuals, you and I, and he's saying, dear one, you're on mute. You can unmute now. He's calling on, you can unmute now. You don't have to wear this bag of excuses any longer because you have a story worth telling. And it's too good to keep to yourself. And so beep, beep. Let's go, dear one. Let's go, warrior. Let's go. Can you say amen to that? In fact, I want to introduce you to a man in scripture who, like you and I, had kind of muted himself at a crucial moment in time when it came to vocalizing his faith in Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest friends. And after Jesus resurrected from the dead and, and, and ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came just heavy on this guy at Pentecost. And through his sharing, thousands, thousands of people came to know Jesus through him. His name was Peter. And so I want to invite you today, go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to need that today. And go with me to the book of Acts this morning. Book of Acts chapter 4. That's where we're going to be looking at today. Chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 8. Now a little bit of context here on what's taking place. Peter and John had just been, they're on their way to the temple in the afternoon to pray. And there's this crippled man coming up alongside them and asking for money. Like this was just a common practice. If they, there was somebody in need, they would come to ask people for money. And so Peter boldly turns to him and says, Hey man, I, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I say, rise up. And then Peter, he reaches down, you guys, he reaches down and he grabs this guy by the arm and he helps him up. And this man who had been crippled from his mother's womb is now raising, raised to his feet and immediately his ankles and his feet took up strength. And this man, he began to, to walk and then he began to run. And then he began to just praise God for what had happened. And because of this man screaming at the top of his lungs, praises to God, thousands of people Man, thousands of onlookers who knew this guy came to Peter and John in this once crippled man. Now, I want to just pause here for a moment. I want to just share with you that, man, we are a four square church that believes in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe miracles and healings happen not just then, but today. We experience it. We've experienced, many of us have experienced it, and we expect it. And so here's, here's Jesus just moving powerfully, Holy Spirit moving powerfully through John and, and, and Peter and then powerful things are happening. They were expectant of it as well. Let's go back to it. Thousands of people, man, are surrounding Peter and John. And Peter, he sees this opportunity, right? He sees this opportunity to unmute and to share the gospel with all these people. And, and the result of this miracle when it went down, went everywhere. I mean, coconut wireless all over Jerusalem, right? And because of all this commotion, the religious leaders were outraged. And, and they seized Peter and John to have them explain themselves, like, what's going on? And they asked them, by what power and what name did you do this? And so that's where we'll pick up in verse 8, where it says, it says this. It says, then Peter 
filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let's just pause here for a moment. I, I know we just started the verse. Let's pause here for a moment because I want you to hear this. Just the, even in this earlier verse, I, I, want, I want us to see that Peter is not sharing out of his own wisdom, cleverness, or past experience. This is not a script for him to share. No, the Spirit of God is sharing through Peter who he is. And so we see Peter fulfilling the Great Commission, right? He's, he's partnering with God. He's partnering with God to reach his world. He's partnering with God to reach his world. And so it continues on in verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for the acts of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked, How was he healed? Then know this. You and all of people of Israel, it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified. Man, Peter, let me pause. Peter's not holding anything back, man. He's not pulling any punches here. He is, is he? And so he goes on and he says, But man, God whom raised him from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Like this is why he's healed is because of Jesus. In verse 11, it says this, Jesus is, and he quotes scripture, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Man, I love that. I love that. Man, it's, it's just this authority that Peter is sharing and John is sharing out of is incredible. I mean, just think about Peter before Jesus was crucified and how he just was just afraid to share who he lived for. But yet now with bold, with boldness filled with the Holy Spirit, he's sharing. Isn't that credible? Now, now watch this because this is good. Verse 13, when they saw, this is the council, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. They were blown away. And they took note that these men have been with Jesus. Isn't that good? That's so good. I mean, the guys listening to Peter and John are like the best of the best when it comes to understanding the law, the Torah. And, and they are like, man, aren't these guys just fishermen? Wow. I mean, they're quoting scriptures. They're, they're calling us out. They're speaking with authority. Wow. But watch this. I love this. Check this out. He's like, he's saying that by the end of this verse, in verse 13, by the end of it, it says that they took note. Go ahead and underline that phrase in your Bible if you'd like. Go ahead and underline that. So good. That these men had been with Jesus. They recognized that these ordinary farm-fed boys from Galilee didn't look the part. But they, when they opened their mouth, come on somebody, they opened their mouth, they took note that these guys had been with with Jesus. Can I ask us this morning, does your words help others around you recognize that you've been with Jesus? Does your words reflect Jesus to people? Now that's this question I wrestle with daily and I just want to just allow us to sit in that question for a moment. Does your words reflect Jesus to others around you? Do they know, man, hey, this person's been with Jesus. I can tell by the way they share. And so let's keep going. Verses 14, it says this, But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. And so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, to leave the room as they conferred together, as they talked. And, and verse 16, they said this, What are we, we going to do with these men? They asked, Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed the notable sign and, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Verse 18, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But verse 19, you guys, check this out. Peter, here he goes again. Peter and John they replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. 
in that space. Like you're saying, like, just in other words, what they're, what's happening is Peter is saying and John is saying, guys, I can't be muted. I ain't saying silent. I did that once before when I heard the rooster crow and I ain't doing it again. Jesus is far too good to keep to myself. And so we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Can someone say amen to that? Isn't that awesome? And so what does this look like in our lives today? I mean, for Peter and John, I mean, it was so natural because Holy Spirit was in them and moving powerfully through them. But for us today, in our modern world, in all of this, all of the stuff that's going on in our world, how can we courageously share as God's people what we've seen and heard in Jesus? How do we do that? What does that look like? And so what I want to do in the rest of our time together is just give us two encouragements, two encouraging words to help us to take one step closer, just one, one little step closer to unmute and be courageous in sharing our faith in Christ to whoever God brings our way. Can you say amen to that, somebody? And so here's your for Monday, okay? If you're taking notes, would you jot this down? I want to encourage you to number one, number one, unmute to those who, who, regu who you regularly encounter, unmute who you live for. Unmute who you live for. Now, I know that sounds super simple, but it's not. I want to encourage you to go for it. This week, I want to encourage you to go for it. I love in the scriptures how Peter boldly and John boldly make it clear to these religious leaders of who they live for in verse 12, right? Where it says this, where Peter says, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So in other words, what Peter is saying is, is there's no one who can compare to Jesus. There's no one that is able to come close to Jesus. He's the only way to be saved and the only way to not just have a, a fully alive life after death, but to experience a fully alive life now, right now. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief has come to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. And so for your Monday, what I want to ask you to do is to unmute yourself, to, to share who you live for. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to share with one person, watch this, one person who doesn't know you are a follower of Jesus, that you're a follower of Jesus. But listen, family, when I say to share with one person that you're a follower of Jesus, I don't mean that, that if somebody sneezes at class or in your workspace and you say, God bless you, don't think that that's you saying that, 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 that you live for Jesus. Like, don't think that they're going to know that you're one that lives for Jesus if you say, God bless you. Like, oh, I think they know. I think they know now. No, no. <laughs> I want to encourage us. I want to just exhort us today. I want to encourage us to be clear and courageous and convince yourself that there is no greater person in your life that you live for than Jesus. Can you say amen to that somebody? In fact, last Saturday evening, I, I want to share this short story. My family and I went to my mother-in-law's retirement party and, and her name is Paz. She re is retiring after over 20 years of being a family doctor with Kaiser. Anyway, there was a moment at her party where, where she stood up in front of her guests and thanked everyone for coming to celebrate this milestone moment with her. She then honored a few key people that helped her on her journey from, a child, from her childhood friends that came over from California to those that she worked alongside in the medical field. But what struck me the most out of the whole evening was at the end of her speech, in front of all of her family and her friends and her fellow doctors, much of whom probably don't believe in Jesus, she, she stood in front of them and boldly said, and most importantly, I want to thank God for the opportunity to serve hundreds of people as a doctor for all these years. And I want you to know that, that there's only, it's only because of Jesus being in my life that I was able to accomplish all that I did. And, and, and I love this because she, she added this part. She said, if you didn't know already, he loves you so much. Jesus loves you so much and he has a plan for your life. Now, oh, guys, after hearing that family, I was just overwhelmed and I was just so proud of her for being unmuted and unashamed, 
to proclaim Jesus and who she lived for in front of all that she, in front of all these people she cared about. And family, my prayer and my hope is that we would do the same, that we would be a people that are so alive in Christ that people would, who know us but don't know God will know God, would want to know God because they know us. Does that make sense? And so, again, number one, I want to just encourage us to unmute who we live for. Unmute who we live for t- from, to those around us. Now, number two, if you're taking notes, jot this down. You have to know that you were made for this moment. You have to know that you're made for this moment. There's an urgency to this. Just like Peter and John were chosen for that moment to, to, in time to speak courageously for Jesus in front of all of those Jewish, Jewish rulers, you and I are chosen and called for such a time as this. He's chosen you and I to be His people on our world, in our, in, on the earth today. And I think about all of the people that God could have chose, right? All of the people like, like William Wilberforce who, demol- who helped to demolish slavery or Charles Spurgeon, the amazing preacher or the apologetic C.S. Lewis or Catherine Booth and William Booth, the, the beginners of Salvation Army or Martin Luther King Jr. or Mother Teresa, all great men and women throughout history whose love for Jesus changed the world. But yet, in God's ultimate wisdom, He decided in this moment in history on the earth to choose not Dietrich Bonhoeffer or not St. Augustine. No, he wanted to choose you and I. He wanted to choose you, Karen. He wanted to choose you, Rini, to be ministers on the earth right now. He he, He could have chose Amy Carmichael. He could have chose Billy Graham. But instead, he chose you, Franklin. Or he chose you, Darlene, or Tico, or Ray. He chose you to live right now in this cultural moment. And and so what I want us to just know this morning is that whenever God puts around us these situations, these divine appointments, these moments for us to share and be bold and to unmute, I want you to know that you're made for this moment. You can do you have what it takes. The Spirit of God lives in you. Whatever you're facing right now, And whoever God strategically puts around you, places around you, can I tell you again, you were made for this moment. You were made for this moment. If you're watching this with somebody, turn to someone right now next to you and say, you're made for this moment. You're made for this moment. Can you say amen to that? Amen, family. Amen. In fact, if you look back at the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 15 through 18 in this story, you'll find something pretty interesting. You'll see that that, that it says that the Sanhedrin, these, these Jewish rulers that were listening to Peter and John in that moment had them leave the room, right? They had them leave the room in order for them to confer with one another what they should do. But watch this. It's so interesting that the Bible records these guys' um, words. I mean, it, it records what they said in that tight circle in verses 16 through 17. And you know what that tells me? And this is not just speculation. This is true. It tells me that some of those religious leaders that were in the room with Peter and John, some of them that were part of the Sanhedrin later became followers of Jesus. And they shared this moment with Luke who wrote the book of Acts at at, at a moment that was significant to them in their walk with Christ. And so you know what that tells me today? It tells me that, that there's hope for those who were once the biggest critics of Jesus to one day become converts of Jesus. Do you know anybody like that? And so today I wanna just encourage you to never forget to unmute and know that you're made for this moment, that you have a story worth telling and so don't keep it to yourself. Listen, the news isn't meant to be watched on mute. Have you ever tried to watch the news on mute? No, you don't. You can't, it's useless, but it has to be turned on. There has to be audio. We have to have this voice to share. Some people often go to a verse, uh, uh, a quote from um, St. Saint a- Saint Francis of Assisi who said, um, share the gospel and if necessary, use words. But his intention was not to mute ourselves. His intention was to let our lips speak, let our lips follow our lives. Let our lives and our lips be aligned. 
And so I want to just encourage us. I want to just encourage us today that we don't watch the news on mute and we have the greatest news in the world. And so I want to just encourage you and I to be bold in sharing it as as well as knowing that you were made for this moment in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. Now I want to wrap up our time together um, by just going back to this bag, backpack of excuses, this bag of excuses that sometimes mutes us from the privilege of sharing the good news. You see, I, I, I can tell you from personal experience that the more I, was, I abided in Jesus, the more I, he reminded me of, of this bag of excuses that would often mute my opportunities to share his goodness. And, and, and it would hold me back from living this life that was fully alive in him. And so the more I spent time with Jesus, the more I would be with him and I would be more convinced of what he said over my intellect or my inexperience over my in- insecurities. He, he, he would speak with power over this in comparison to his word over my life. And so one by one, when, when I spent time with him in scripture, in, in prayer and, and, and just just kind of connected with him, Jesus would write over my old playlist, my old unhealthy self-talk and remind me, he would remind me of who I am and who he's called me to be. And so whenever I would say things like, Lord, listen, Lord, I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough to share with these people. He would would say, who gave you your tongue, Jared, to speak? I did, like I gave Moses. I gave you your tongue. In fact, I've given you the mind of, of Christ. And then whenever I would say, but Lord, I'm, I'm inexperienced, you know, I mean, I'm inexperienced to share in front of these people. They're so wise. They're so, they're older than me. They have more life experience. And he would say, Jared, who don't, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity, purity. Like King David, when, when he was called, he, I look at the, the man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at your heart, Jared. And so listen to that. And so throw that. And whenever I would say things like, but Lord, I, I'm, I'm too busy with all of the, that drama and, and I'm too busy with like my stuff and my issue and my thing. And, and you know, like I just, I'm, I'm too busy. Every time he would say that, every time I would say that, he, he would come back and he would say, I wasn't too busy for your drama. I wasn't too busy for you. I left the 99 and I went after the one. And that one was you. And so are you willing to do the same for me? You guys, every excuse that I pulled out of this bag, God spoke over until there was none left. And I'm confident, family, I'm confident, listen, that, that God is looking for men and women like you and I who are willing to unmute who they live for and know that they were made for this moment, this cultural moment in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that, family? I can think of no other group of people like you and I to, to reach the world and to be vocal in our faith than you and me in this time today. And so I want to just encourage us as we wrap up today, I want to just encourage us to go for it. Let's go. Beep, beep. We can do it. Let's open our mouths and share. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, well, how do we do that? Like, like what is the details of, of how to share my faith? I want to just encourage you this week to get together in your life group. If you're not part of a life group right now, I want you to connect with myself or, or, or one of the pastors to connect you in a life group. This is gonna be a group of people that will cheer you on during moments where you feel overwhelmed. And so I wanna just encourage you to do that. Peter and John were together. You need somebody alongside you as well. And so get together and share with one another in your life group how you each have shared your faith with other people and just learn from each other. What are the best practices of your faith in sharing? And and I promise you, God is gonna move in that time. Family, imagine with me what it would look like if we all were to unmute who we live for and know that we were made for this moment. How would that affect our everyday lives? Listen, I believe that it would change everything in our homes, in our church, in our community, 
and most importantly in our world in Jesus name can you say amen to that family amen let's pray together loving father we just thank you we come to you right now and thank you so much for your work in our lives we thank you Lord that that just being with you abiding in you just moves so powerfully through us your spirit moves so powerfully through us that when we meet with you we can't help but share the stuff that you've done in our lives and so help us Lord God in moments of of uh, divine appointments when you bring people along this week each one of us Lord God um, come in contact with people that we that we see regularly every each week Lord I pray that you would give us like Peter the words to share that you would give us boldness and be, be courageous to not hold anything back Lord God to not mute ourselves in those situations but Lord help us to be bold Help us to be courageous and convinced that you are the only one we live for. And so, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We give you glory in our lives today, not just with our, with our lips, but with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Cheers.